Turn your Bibles to Romans 13. Romans 13. Lots of coughing going on out there, sniffling going on. You guys know I've had it for a few weeks. I actually thank you for your prayers today. I, I feel a little stronger than normal, so I appreciate that. And uh, when you hear somebody cough, you pray for them. And if you have to cough, that's fine. I'm just glad you're at church. Uh, a lot of people don't come when they when they have a cough. So today I want to move on in our personal management series about uh, managing ourselves, managing uh, what God has given us, and talk about managing our time. How well do you manage your time generally? How uh, how well do you make use of the time that God gives you? Uh, specifically, how well, how quality is the time that you have with God, your spiritual time, I would call that. Each time that, that uh, during the week or each day that uh, you spend with the Lord, spend time with God, is that quality time? Is that good time? Or is that rushed through time? Generally, uh, people are spiritual procrastinators. Now, we all know what a procrastinator is. Pro- procrastinator is one that says, why do today something you can put off till tomorrow? Isn't that pretty much what a procrastinator does? If you can put it off, then you put it off. I'm guilty of that. A lot of people are guilty of that, where you just put something off, find the smallest reason. Spiritual procrastination is very similar to that, only it just has to do with your walk with God. Are you putting off reading your Bible? Are you putting off spending time in prayer. It's basically saying to God, yeah, Lord, I'll get to it, just not right now. Uh, I know I should be doing this today, but I'm, I'm going to do it uh, tomorrow. Or I, I know last week I didn't spend much time to you, but I got a busy week this week, Lord, so uh, I'll make up for it, you know, sometime later on. But later on usually doesn't come. It's real easy to just procrastinate our relationship with God right out of the picture where we just spend little bitty pieces of God. I'm not pieces of time with God. I'm not talking about time at church. I'm talking about your personal individual time that you spend with the Lord. A spiritual procrastinator is someone that says, I'm going to talk to God about that later. I know I need to pray, but I'm going to, I'm going to, I'll do it just later. A spiritual procrastinator is someone who says, I've got plenty of time to go to church, I've got plenty of time to read my Bible, I've got plenty of time to pray, I've got plenty of time to bless others later, just not today. I'll do it tonight when I get home, or I'll do it uh, at, a, at a later time, I'll do it tomorrow. We just generally forget when we make those promises, it's really not to God, it's a promise to ourselves, and we just God ends up on the back burner, putting off spiritual things. We have good intentions, but bad follow-through. Time is not an unlimited resource. We act like it is. We live our lives like it is an unlimited resource, and we've always got plenty of time, but time is a diminishing resource. It's every second, every minute of every day that goes by, you, don't, you won't ever get back. It's gone. <clears throat> John Wayne spent his life making movies, a lot of movies. I love to watch an old John Wayne movie. He made more than 170 movies. He died at the age of 72, and as he was approaching his death, he, was, he made this uh, interesting statement, I never thought life would be so short. Never thought life would be so short. He did a lot in his life. But when he knew that the time was coming, that he was approaching death, it all seemed so short. It's amazing how when you have your life in front of you, you feel like you've got all the time in the world. You've got plenty of time. You've got, uh, you, you can put things off and still expect to get to it later. But no matter how old you are, whether you're young or old, when you're looking behind you, It seems like it all went by so fast. That's just how time is. When we look behind us, we wonder, where has the time gone? How many times do you hear somebody say that? Boy, where has the time gone? 
Billy Graham just turned 97. I love, uh, uh, I love to quote Billy Graham. I love to talk about Billy Graham. What an amazing life uh, that he has lived for the Lord and things that he has done for the Lord. A few years ago, he was asked to reflect back upon his life and asked what he thought about his life. And he said, I regret that I didn't do more for God's kingdom. Billy Graham. He looks back on his life. I look at his life and I think, how could anybody get done even near as much as he did for God's kingdom? And he looks at his life and he says, I could have done more. I should have done more. As we get old, that kind of becomes our perspective looking back on life. I wish I'd have done more of this. Nobody says, I wish I'd have spent more time at the office. Nobody says, I wish I'd have spent more time earning money. But a lot of people say, I wish I'd have spent more time with my family, with my kids, with my parents, with my grandparents, with with, uh, friends. It just becomes our perspective. Time is a gift. It is a, a valuable commodity that we have in our life. And you can't buy more of it. We may have plenty of money, but you can't buy more time. You only get the time that God has allotted you. And we need to be wise in how we use that. And we only get one chance to use that time. We need to be wise in how we use it. Paul, in three places I want us to look at today, talks about time. Puts a little different reflection on each one of these. And so if you were to ask Paul... What time is it? These are the responses I think that you would get. The first one is it's time to wake up. It is time to wake up. That's Romans chapter 13. Look at Romans chapter 13 verse 11. It says, And this do, knowing the time, that it is already the hour for you to awaken from sleep, for now salvation is nearer to us than when we believe. Paul uses a a phrase in there that you probably don't catch when you first look at it. But uh, you know that feeling when when you wake up in the morning, or no, you don't wake up in the morning, when you're fast asleep and the alarm goes off and the thought that comes to your mind is, already, it's already time to get up. It seems like I just went to sleep. Why is that alarm going off? Already, Well, Paul had that same experience. Now, it may not have been a digital clock, and it may not have been a beeping sound, but he had the same experience in the first. That's not new to us. That was, that's been going on for thousands of years. And that's what Paul is referring to in this verse. Look at it again. It says, And this do, knowing the time, that it is already the hour for you to awaken from sleep. When the rooster would start to crow, when the, the light would first start to pierce through the, uh, the doorway or the window, and even in, in his day, that same thought would come to their mind. Oh, already. He's saying, yes, it's already time. It's already time to get up. It's already time to awaken from your slumber. But he's putting a spiritual twist on it. He says, salvation is nearer to us than when we first believed. That's uh, probably a better word that we could use for that, is to, to use the word eternity. You know, salvation, we, we tend to associate with getting saved and getting baptized. He's not talking about that. He's talking about when you die, you're going to be in eternity, and that is closer to you every single day that you live. Eternity is closer to you than when it was when you first believed. Eternity is closer to you than what it was yesterday. What are you doing with your time? It's time to wake up. We tend to look at a a passage like this, especially when we see the word salvation, and we want to make it about salvation. We want to make it about getting saved. Um, So we tend to apply this. we, We read a verse like this, and we think it's, well, that's about lost people. That's about people that need to get saved. But Paul's not talking to lost people here. A lot of times he does. He spends a lot of time in Romans in particular talking about being saved and and talking about lost people. But he's talking to believers in this passage. 
He's not talking about there are people going to hell and hell is closer than it's ever been. Now, that's a true statement. That's just not his point that he's making in this passage. He's talking about believers being closer to their eternity than they ever have been before, and it's time to wake up. It's time to use the time that God has given you in a fruitful way. Look at the rest of uh, chapter 13 in Romans. Look at what else he says. Verse 12, the night is almost gone, and the day is at hand. Let us therefore lay aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us behave properly as in the day, not in carousing or drunkenness, not in sexual promiscuity and sensuality, not in strife and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh in regard to its lusts. That's not talking about lost people. That's talking about you and me. These things that he names here, lust and promiscuity and, and worldliness, he's telling believers, don't do that. Don't be involved in that. There's no time for that. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Make no provision for the flesh. So here's a personal question. Have you made provision for the flesh? In your time, in the time that you spend each day, do you make provision for the flesh? Do you say, you know, Lord, I'm going to be uh, I'm going to be good, I'm going to be faithful, I'm going to pray, I'm going to spend time with you each day this week, but I probably on Thursday night will go out with some friends and get drunk. But just once. Don't make provision for the flesh. Don't plan on, on sinning. Don't plan on, we have enough sin that we run into as it is. Don't add to it by planning to sin, making provision for your flesh sometime this week. Paul says, wake up. We don't have time to waste doing those silly things. Wake up. It's time to wake up. Another verse he talks about time is in Ephesians chapter 5, where he says it's time to wise up. It's time to wake up. It's time to wise up. I have the verse up here on the screen. It says, therefore, be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise making the most of your time because the days are evil. Most of us have heard those verses, especially verse 16, talking about our time, how we spend our time. Be careful what you do with your time. Don't be foolish with your time. Be wise with your time. I want you to pretend with me for a second. I want you to pretend... that this is a stack of $1,440 bills. It'd probably be a little taller than that, but uh, this is all Renee would let me use for my illustration. So, <laughs> so I've, got a, I've got a few here. But just imagine that, that this is a stack of $1,440 bills. Every day you get one of these. Wouldn't that be great? Every day you wake up and you have a stack of $1,440 bills and you can use it however you want. You can buy things, you can spend, buy things for yourself, you can buy things for others, but at the end of the day of that stack of $1,441 bills, the ones you don't spend, they disappear. They just are gone. But it's okay because, because the next day you're going to get another stack of $1,441 bills, and you can do them, you can spend them or use them however you want. You can, uh, you can uh, buy things, you can buy food with them, you can uh, blow your nose with them, you can tear them up and throw them up in the air with them, you can uh, throw them at friends, you could light a fire with it, you can do anything you want, throw it in the trash, uh, throw it at cars from a bridge and see what they do, you can you can have all kinds of fun with this money. You could spend it on other people. You could spend it on yourself. It really doesn't matter because you get 1,440 of these every single day. Few people would wad their money up and, and throw it at Carissa. 
even if you get 1,440 of those every day. Few people would burn it. Few people would waste it. Because we look at this and, and we see something more we can really do things with. You get 1,440 minutes every single day. At the end of the day, they're gone. Whether you've used them wisely, whether you've used them prudently, whether you have wasted them, either way, they're gone. Now, tomorrow, you're going to get 1,440 more. What are you going to do with those? The point is not that we have plenty because we're going to get 1,400 more tomorrow, so it doesn't matter what we do with them. The point is, how wise are you being with those minutes that God has given you? How wise are you being in how you use them just for this day? Forget about tomorrow. We're not promised tomorrow. How are you using those minutes today? Remember when I preached on money a couple weeks ago, I, I uh, began this series on, on, uh, on management, on stewardship, on, uh, on how we manage the resources that God uh, gives us. And I appreciate Gil's testimony a while ago. I asked him to, to bring that. I'm trying to get um, a, a deacon each week to share their, their personal uh, testimony about tithing, and, and that encourages all of us to hear from others how God has blessed them. On the first a message in this series, I talked about money, and I emphasized how 100% of our money is God's, not 10%. We tend to look at it as if we, we, have, we get 90% and we give God 10%. No, God owns it all. And the, the message that I gave from uh, Luke chapter 16 emphasizes that of how God is the the, uh, the owner, like an owner of a business, and we are the manager. It all belongs to him. We're just managing it. It's the same way with our time. All of our time belongs to God. All of it. But he's given 1,440 minutes to us each day, and he wants to see us manage that wise. He expects us to be uh, prudent in the decisions that we make with that time, not to waste it and throw it away. Time to wise up. Time to wake up. Time to wise up. And the last thing Paul would say is it's time to free up. Now, this is a, a, a passage. I'm going to put it on the screen behind me in just a second. But 1 Corinthians chapter 7 is a, is a difficult passage. You don't hear a lot of uh, sermon points out of that. It's mostly talking about uh, about marriage, and P Paul is trying to emphasize a point of uh, if you, you don't have to get married. If you don't get married, maybe that will be an opportunity for you to spend more time focusing on the Lord and using your time for the Lord and not be uh, distracted. But some people need to get married so they're not distracted by passions and, and marriage becomes a tool that helps them be more helpful in the kingdom of God. It's a long uh, interwoven discussion, but in the middle of that discussion, he mentions something about time, and I want us to see that today. It's a long passage. Look at it with me. He says, but let me say this, dear brothers and sisters, the time that remains is very short. So from now on, those with wives should not focus on their, should not focus only on their marriage. Those who weep or who rejoice or who buy things should not be absorbed by their weeping or their joy or their possessions. Those who use the things of the world should not become attached to them. For this world, as we know it, will soon pass away. I want you to be free from the concerns of this life. It's a long passage, and uh, it, it gets a little confusing in the things he's saying about uh, about marriage, but his point is, be careful with your time. Keep your, your time free, he says, free uh, from the concerns of this life. You can see the reference on there is the New Living Translation. I think that gives us the best translation of this passage, and in particular, that last phrase, that we need to be free from the concerns of this life. If the concerns of this life are a drain on our time or a burden on our time, 
we shouldn't be involved in whatever that concern is. Uh, if it's something that is getting in the way of us serving the Lord, we need to not have that in our life. He says in verse 29, the time that remains is very short. He said that same thing in each one of these passages in a little bit different way. The time that remains is, is very short. We don't know how much time we as individuals have left on this earth. We don't know if there's a tomorrow for us. Uh, there have been a lot of deaths and funerals this week. Uh, some of uh, senior adults, some one yesterday of a very young man, 31. We don't know when our time is going to come. We need to make use of every 1,440 minutes of every day that we can in a wise way, not waste them. Nor do we know how much time Christianity has. This is a little bit more of a, a, a broad picture. Christianity has only so much time left to reach a lost world. Jesus died on the cross and was resurrected uh, 2,000 years ago, a little over 2,000 years ago. It, on God's calendar, has he decided Christianity has... Uh, 2,175 years to reach a lost world before Jesus returns and there's no more time left. That might be just outside of your lifetime, 2,175, but you still need to use your lifetime as a Christian to reach as many lost people in this world as you can because Christianity's time is coming to an end. We don't know when that time is. We can't predict that. The Lord knows. Only the Lord knows. All we know is we need to make wise use of every minute of every day. God gives us every minute of every day. So we will use it for him. We live in the greatest country. Ever. Ever. We live in the most prosperous time ever. We live in the most blessed uh, country ever. We live in the most blessed state, I feel, in this country, in the blessed time, with the most resources and the best opportunities. I do not want God to look down upon my time on this earth and say, look at all these things I have given you. And you just wasted that time. All these opportunities to reach a lost world, all these opportunities to use the resources I have given you materially for God's kingdom, and you just wasted it. It's all God's. We owe it to Him to be wise in how we use our time. It's time to wake up, it's time to wise up, and it's time to free up. How faithful are you with? God's time that he has given you. Let me ask you to bow your head. How would God feel about your 1,440 minutes that you spent yesterday? How many of those did you leave on the dresser that disappeared at the end of the day that were used for absolutely no good thing? Or the day before that? Or the week before that? Your time is a resource that he's given you. He wants to see your faithfulness in it. Ask him how you can better make use of your time this week to glorify him and to glorify his kingdom. Just a moment, we're going to stand and sing. You may want to come kneel and pray or pray with somebody or pray for somebody. But take a moment just to ask the Lord how you can improve the way you use your time in the coming weeks. Lord Jesus, we come before you. We thank you for the instruction from your word. We thank you for its encouragements of how we can better live our lives for you, better spend our time for your kingdom. 
Lord, I pray that your spirit will just move among us and convict our hearts uniquely, each person in this room, of opportunities that we have before us that we can spend our time better. We can manage our time better and influence more for your kingdom. Lord, I pray your spirit will be free in our hearts today to speak. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I invite you to stand and sing. The altar is open today.